Hey everyone, my name is Mike Lucas from Sears. Uh, I'll be conducting this webinar today. We're going to be talking about GCP infrastructure optimization, um, as well as some some uh, I don't know. I would I, I would say some some foxhole stories um, that uh, that Sears and Google have have built up over time doing a few of these for our customers. Um, we'll be focusing on GCP infrastructure optimization in the realm of uh, compute storage as well as kubernetes which adds some increased complexity so some uh, the focuses we're going to be uh or i would say what we were, we're going to be focusing on is is compute optimization storage optimization and then kubernetes optimization um so joining me uh will be well actually i'll give you the, the introduction so far so so uh, first off uh, we're going to start off with our introduction of, of the, the panelists today um our vision you know the the purpose for this uh, workshop, what we wanted to achieve. Um, we're going to walk you through some technical tips and tricks uh, for GCP infrastructure optimization, and then we'll open up for uh, for a Q and A from from from, uh, from the attendees. We'll also have a message from Google about um, some active GCP programs for running cost optimization for the um, for the coming year, and give you a little bit of information about Cirrus as well along the way. Okay, so uh, joining us uh, for this presentation are me, Mike Lucas, Solutions Architect Series, as well as Mac Bari, um, who is a regional lead at Google Cloud. Um, I'll let him give his, uh, his introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being here, and thanks for Sears for hosting. Uh, my name is Mac Bari. I manage the SMB programs for the Americas. Um, so, been in Google for five years in different scopes, from enterprise sales to strategy and uh, strategy and programs management. Uh, prior to Google, I was in Microsoft, and overall, um, have been in the cloud side of Google since its inception. Uh, really looking forward to uh, talking more about the programs at the very end of this presentation. Michael, over to you. Wonderful, Mac. Thanks for that. I feel like our, our momentum has been established. Um, so, uh, all right. So, let's see, Cirrus. So, Cirrus has been in uh, in uh, in business for 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 more than fourteen years. We actually have over three thousand customers in the U.S. and Asia uh, Pacific um, regions. Um, you know, our goal is to what we call futurify um, our customers' technology, um, prepare it for the next stage of evolution. So, uh, you know, our biggest focus right now is in cloud and machine learning. Most of the projects we've done over the last few years have been in the cloud ecosystem, ranging from like, you know, medium scale businesses to large enterprise customers. Um, though we do have uh, quite a small, a few smaller startups as well on our book. You know, the, the difference is, is really interesting between a smaller and medium sized company versus smaller startups oftentimes smaller startups will have more complexity to their cloud infrastructure um, than uh, than a medium business but with less cost it's really amazing to see that difference i think i think this is um you know due to some smaller companies um, preference for adopting uh newer native cloud technologies but we'll get into that in a little bit um so you know when it comes to infrastructure you know we do migration platform as a service integration ci cd setup and, and automation um, and most of our projects are centered around like serverless infrastructure, Kubernetes, containerization, and microservices implementation. So actually, um, one of our internal uh, platforms um, was one of the first um, public applications built on um, or production applications built on App Engine. So we are um, very much supporters of the serverless concept. Um, I work uh, mostly on Kubernetes workloads, which is why the message I'm bringing to you today is, is regarding Kubernetes. Um, but Cirrus itself, I mean, we have a lot of uh, experience working with some, some of the more advanced native cloud tech like um, AI machine learning in, in multiple clouds, but primarily GCP. So um, we also dabble, or I would say, um, are strong in application development. Um, so we have a tenured team of developers who have worked on a number of app dev projects across many different platforms, so, you know, Java, Python, Visual Basic, uh, Net, and a bunch of uh, different other databases. So, um, you know, we, we try to branch out. You know, one of the reasons we, um, um, 
we have such a broad level of experience is because our goal is to be a full service technology co um, company for our customers. Uh, we want to be able to solve multiple problems, not just infrastructure, not just containers, um, but um, but solve problems across the breadth of, uh, of the domain that our customers are dealing with. Um, so that's led us to, to learn and expand in all kinds of different ways. Um, so uh, data analytics and machine learning, again, one of the newest and most trending services the last few, uh, five years. In fact, some of our most um, interesting projects we delivered in 2018 and 2019 were machine learning projects. And we have a dedicated team of AI and ML engineers who have done some really amazing projects for our clients. So um, if you're interested in, in, in learning more about that or if you have problems about ML, um, reach out to us, we'll see what we can do. Uh, okay, so um, while most of our key customers belong to logistics, manufacturing, and emerging tech space, over the last five years, we have seen a significant growth in e-commerce and cloud native businesses. Okay, so um, for obvious reasons, given the whole shift in, in um, industrial ecosystem we have seen in the last decade. So um, it, again, it's a big mix of, of larger enterprise, smaller um, startups, uh, medium-sized businesses. Um, we, don't, um, we don't attack any specific uh, um, company size, we, we focus on the problem, we focus on solving these problems and, and, and creating uh, creative solutions for our customers. Mac wanted to take over the, <laughs> the vision um, conversation, right, Mac? All right, so, um, you know, we have an action pack agenda, so I'll, I'll keep this one brief. Um, so I trust everybody can see the screen. Um, in a nutshell, in Q4 of last year, I noticed a gap in our SMB market uh, and our go-to-market strategy. And uh, we immediately kicked off an initiative in learning our, our spending customer base, spanning from customers trying out GCP for the first time to having critical workloads with us. Um, our go-to-market was very focused towards acquiring new businesses and new logos. And so we needed a partner and we needed a team of people that would engage with over 100 customers in, the, in Q4 and, and learn what our customer needs are, our voice of the customer, if you may. Uh, Sears was well positioned to deliver the, uh, the technical solutions delivery piece of the puzzle. So naturally it was a, it was a fit. Um, so over the last four months, what started off as a pilot uh, and what ended up in where we are now in February as a global program uh, with resources from our engineering team, product team and our machine learning team uh, combined together, you know, our learnings were uh, astounding. Um, so in a nutshell, if, if, we could, if I could distill the slide into one statement uh, in summary, we learned that our customers are resource constrained and with the right level of knowledge, engagement and incentives, customers can actually complete their cloud journey. There's a lot of customers and companies uh, that we see that start on the cloud journey, but somewhere in the middle, uh, things get difficult. Um, and if, specifically, when I'm talking about, you know, when we live in a world with fast moving business objectives and product offerings from cloud vendors, it is very hard to keep alignment. Um, so, you know, what, what we have discovered is when we have a continued partnership with our customers and a white glove approach, of having a one-to-one -one relationship through the right mix of incentives, workshops, and resourcing, that our customers, uh, when compared to a control group, are three times more likely to complete their cloud journey and actually achieve the business objectives that set out, um, that that's basically started the conversation with GCP. Um, so with that said, you know one of the key pillars is infrastructure modernization. 55% of our engagements in Q4 were customers asking to how best to optimize and modernize their environment. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it over to Michael right now, who's gonna go through the, the, uh, the meat of this uh, content, and then uh, we'll, we'll walk through the program side uh, at the very end of the observation or presentation. Over to you, Michael. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, you have a way with words, my friend. Uh, I always jumble them up, more focused on uh, I don't know, the tech, I suppose. Um, all right, so uh, GCP infrastructure optimization. Um, so what we're gonna do here is walk you through um, 
Well, I want to I want to think that it's it's like a mix between a stream of thought uh, and guiding principle list um, that I use while I'm deciding, um, you know, working with a customer to decide you know, what we should do about cost optimization for this customer. Um, so you'll get um, some valuable um, content here on on how you might be able to do this for your for your own company, but also. Um, you'll be able to um, kind of see the, the complexity that's involved in doing the cost optimization because it's um, can be far more complicated than just reading through some charts. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive in. So why do a cost optimization? Um, you know, there, there are several reasons why, and, and I, I chose to really boil this down to, to the top three that I could think of. Um, obviously cost reduction. Yes, we should do a cost optimization to reduce cost, but that's not the only reason. Um, when I'm doing a cost optimization, I'm also considering um, performance targets. Uh, you know, performance efficiency is, is the term that I like to use. It's important that while you're doing your cost optimization, you're being realistic and, and thinking, you know, hey, you know, my environment will have to grow. Um, if my customer base grows. Um, and ideally, that would be the case. So how am I going to grow? That's the most important part. Um, you know, like, like when you see that, you know, trees uh, that are set up in, in um, sort of a young parking lot where they have the, the cables that tie them down and, and, the, and the rods that help them grow in the right direction. We have to think about how our costs will grow, how our infrastructure will grow, and how do we keep that efficient and point it in the right direction. And the third reason is security. <laughs> yes, actually, security. When you're doing a cost optimization, there's so much more than just looking at charts again. Um, you know, you're really thinking, well, okay, um, what is out there? Why is it there? You know, what is it doing? How hard is it working? Can the application be optimized? You know, you're doing all these things and looking into your infrastructure and invariably, um, our clients discover that there are things running that they didn't need, things running that are old, servers running that are not patched, um, you know, uh, potentially even configurations that pose security problems. Um, and, and so, yeah, security is another reason to do cost optimization. And um, that's actually happened where we've discovered um, security vulnerabilities for a customer during the cost optimization exercise. It's an intensive review of your infrastructure. And these things do pop up. Uh, so what? So what is it, you know, that that we're going to do? Um, what should we be looking at, um, and and why, right? And and so during a cost optimization, you generally want to be looking at the things that cost. So the things that cost are compute, storage, and managed services. Like this is obvious. What's costing me so much? How do I reduce it? But there's also some things we should be looking at that don't cost directly, but affect um, your costs indirectly and, and substantially as well. And some of those things are DevOps practices. You know, how, how might we be able to optimize our deployment strategy um, to, uh, to be more lean, uh, to take advantage of uh, instance groups um, or you know, potentially something like App Engine to be more efficient and to reduce overhead? Um, you know, what are, what are my external dependencies? You know, when, when we do a cost optimization, we don't always only look at GCP costs, we also consider external dependencies. Um, and these external dependencies can cost. Um, so uh, for example, if you have a managed MongoDB service somewhere, or if you're using SendGrid, um, you know, these things have costs associated with them and there may be ways that you could optimize those costs. So it's something to consider. Containerization. Um, you know, there's a, there's a Dilbert cartoon out there that's like, you know, oh, we, we have these problems, how do we solve them? Containers, put it in containers. Um, Kubernetes, you know, that, that's not always the answer. Um, and oftentimes companies will rush into containerization um, because their, develop, their development team wants it, um, but they don't actually build it for cost um, optimization or, or for efficient running. And so, um, and that's a trick, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really tricky to do that for Kubernetes because Kubernetes is its own infrastructure. Uh, and there are configurations uh, um, within that that uh, that really need to be considered. Um, and then, you know, also architectural standards. You know, what what are the things that I am imposing on my infrastructural team for um, for security, for for visibility, for liability? You know, what what are the things that I'm imposing on my team, 
and what are the costs associated with those? Um, I've seen um, a couple environments where 85% of the cost was supporting infrastructure, um, like log aggregation engines and uh, vulnerability scanning and, and things of that nature. Um, and because the, um, the, the primary application infrastructure was so small, um, you know, we were able to reduce the size of these supporting pieces of infrastructure, but they hadn't previously looked at those because they figured, well, we're, we're not going to touch that. We're going to limit the scope of this to just the application. So you have to kind of broaden your thought um, process and look at more things if you want to be accurate and, and learn the most. Okay, and then, and then how? So, so what are some of the ways that we can actually gain visibility, um, build for cost optimization, and reduce costs? So there's Google Billing Report. Google actually has a really great billing console that you can dive into and organize your costs by project, um, by um, product, and even by individual SKU within the products. And, and it really um, allows you to pick out the low-hanging fruits that are costing so much um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and dive in. It's a really great tool. Uh, there's also budget alerts. So if, um, if you haven't worked with budget uh, reports in any other cloud, it uh, works very similar in GCP. Essentially, you set a budget target for the month and you can create alerts um, uh, on, on when you've hit certain percentages of that budget. So let's say your budget is $2,000 a month and you wanna be alerted if you're trending um, above that. So um, you can create an alert where in the middle of the month, if, you're, um, uh, if your costs are 50% of your target cost, then um, you know you're probably okay. But if near the beginning of the month, they're 50% of your target cost, maybe something went wrong. You can also do this with, um, with projected costs. So, um, so I've noticed uh, uh, many of you saw my message um, to drop your names in chat. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Would love to get um, full participation. So if y'all wouldn't mind dropping your names there in chat so I can see uh, who is there, um, who's attending and, and who's actually listening, greatly appreciate it. Um, also, if you have any questions while I'm talking, feel free to drop your questions here in chat along with your name. Um, and then um, what I'll do is um, I'll pause when, um, when there's a good opportunity and, and, and make sure we get to your question. Because chances are, if you have a question, um, then uh, at least two or three other people do too, uh, but they're afraid to ask. So, so you benefit everybody when you ask your questions. Great, thank you so much for all those names. Uh, okay, so, um, so there's also other things you can do. So, so Cloud Run um, uh, is a, sort of a managed um, functions product within Google. And you can actually use it to run um, uh, cost analytics um, with custom logic. So this is, this is a little bit more of an advanced feature. But if there is a situation where you wanted to run cost analytics, um, but make it do very, very specific things, um, check your cost targets against values in other places or compare them to certain things, um, Cloud Run can be used to do this. There's actually some really great guides um, on uh, in Google's documentation on, on how you can leverage this. Um, but again, it's a little bit more of an advanced topic. There's also third-party tools like um, you know, not limited to um, Cloud Ability and, and Cloud Checker, but also there's other tools out there that will ingest GCP Cloud data through the API, analyze that, and then give you some feedback as to um, you know, what sort of um, reservations you can purchase, um, what's overutilized, et cetera. Um, uh, many of these services Google offers within their uh, billing report product, um, uh, but, um, you know, never hurts to have a, a, you know, second opinion, right? Okay, so let's dive in. Um, optimizing compute. So what do I mean by compute? Compute are, compute is uh, servers, essentially, but it could also be other things. Um, and, and for the purposes of this section, we're gonna call compute um, virtual instances, but compute could be um, app engine, compute could be um, uh, GPU products. Uh, there's really a lot of things that, uh, that compute could represent. So I have two things that I like to do um, when I'm optimizing, review and do, right? So what are we going to review for compute? We're gonna review utilization of CPU, RAM, and disk, obviously. Um, because in cloud, you're not just paying for what you're using, you're paying for what you've provisioned, especially on uh, um, more traditional services like, uh, like, like instances versus managed services. 
you pay for the disk you provisioned, not for how much of that disk you're using. Same thing with the CPU. If your CPU is running at 50% utilization, you're paying for that entire CPU, not half of that CPU. So we want to understand our, our utilization across our cluster, um, where that's at, and then what should be done about it. Uh, if your CPU utilization is 5% on 10 different servers, you should definitely consider cutting that server in half or even, um, or even buy more. Um, and in certain circumstances, that's, a, that's, that's possible. So um, we want to understand our utilization and get that data before we do anything. We also want to understand like what are some inefficiencies and in overhead. So we've talked about that before, um, you know, in infrastructure standards um, and DevOps practices, um, but there's also infrastructure design. Maybe there are, there are components of our infrastructure that are designed in such a way that, um, that they're causing cost inefficiencies or uh, maybe you have increased network transit data because um, you're using uh, network appliances like Checkpoint or something to that effect. So um, we want to um, want to understand, uh, you know, where there might be inefficiencies in the overall design. Um, and then what we need to consider is um, investment versus risk, risk, risk reduction. So what I like to do during this stage here is um, think, okay, well, maybe, maybe this one service is over provision. And by putting a certain amount of effort into optimizing it, I could reduce it by 10 bucks a month, right? Um, in reality, I mean, I have to think about how much I'm, I'm, um, paying my engineers to do this. I mean, if I, if I pay my engineers, you know, 50 bucks an hour or, you know, even more, um, how many hours are they going to have to spend in executing the given changes, um, or the recommended changes? And then what is the return on investment for that? Oftentimes companies will, you may have heard the term throwing, um, throwing cores at something in cloud that's possible. You can provision a server with over 100 cores, um, there may be some inefficiencies there, but um, you have to consider return on investment for um, fancy changes and fancy optimizations. Uh, and then do, so do first remove the clutter. Instances not in use, um, old services, uh, you know, uh, things that, that are way over provisioned but have been sunsetted, um, you know, downsize them, remove them, remove the clutter. Next is route, right size. If we see instances that are running at 20% utilization, we can cut those in half very safely. Um, so we would right size things first. Right? Next, monitor. Um, you've just made some changes to your infrastructure. It's important to take a pause now and understand what those changes have done. Um, and um, I've seen this pause last anywhere from a week to three months, um, depending on uh, how much has been changed and what the size and complexity of the infrastructure is. Uh, so next is to consider refactoring and replatforming. So it's very possible to restructure the way that your app is running in order to um, uh, be more cloudy is, is oftentimes what the term is used. Um, and so that could mean refactoring to instance groups. It could mean using App Engine for, for portions of your infrastructure. Um, it, could, uh, it could mean a lot of things, but um, uh, refactoring your platform. Generally, you get an architect involved, a few engineers, have them sit down and, and, um, and think of ways that, that, that this thing could be run more efficiently. And then after all of this has been done, and as a very last step, you should then consider strategic purchasing. So there, there's different ways that you can purchase strategically through um, reservations and, and, um, uh, and agreements. I'll let Mac bring some of those ideas up um, later in the, uh, in the webinar. Uh, but I like to do this stage uh, at the very last because um, I want to make sure that I'm running lean and that I'm clean um, and that, and that my, my, uh, my resources are stable. Because when I strategically purchase, I don't want my resources to then change and fluctuate over time because it's very possible to, to strategically purchase incorrectly and then have that actually be a cost detriment. So we wanna make sure that we're avoiding that. Okay, so next um, we talk about storage. So um, storage is a pretty broad topic. A lot of things that can fall under storage. Um, we're gonna talk about a few um, uh, aspects of storage to consider in cost optimization. So first off, we kinda of have to understand you know, where storage started out. Uh, traditional practices for storage. Uh, it was generally cheap. Um, now, if anybody here has ever purchased anything NetApp, um, then you may um, start to, uh, or you, may, you may have uh, some um, uh, disagreements here, but 
But um, in, in essence, per gig storage was generally cheap. So you bought a whole bunch of it first um, uh, because um, you wanted to do that because recalculation of OPEX or fiscal, uh, mid-fiscal uh, CapEx um, was bad. Um, you know, we, we, we don't want to have to purchase hardware mid-year um, suddenly and, and out of the blue. We want to make sure that we're purchasing enough. And, and so, um, so we purchased far more storage than we needed because that was going to be our top end capability. Um, and so central and over provisioned arrays were considered um, potential scale, but not liability. Um, the more cloudy way to, cons uh, to think about storage is a, a distributed object store, but um, you know, this was not the case in, um, in the way we used to do things. So then you know, we can think about the, the newer cloudy practices, like what, what, are the, what are the things that we're doing now in cloud? Um, uh, we're paying as we go per gigabyte per hour. Um, you know, high utilization percentage is considered efficient. Uh, I remember there was um, one company, um, it was a, a large retail company, I won't use the name, um, who uh, was very, very proud that during a launch of a new e-commerce platform, they were able to keep their average utilization of their instances in their cluster um, at, uh, at or above 96%. And um, traditional IT will say, whoa, you know, 96% utilization, we're in trouble. But, um, but appropriately configured cloud infrastructure can very easily scale through that. Um, <clears throat> so there's also managed uh, storage services like we talked about earlier with GCS, Firebase File Store, et cetera. These ideas are paying per gigabyte, paying per file, paying, you know, paying per use of file. Um, this granular um, billing idea uh, has advantages as well as disadvantages, and you have to make sure that you're um, you're planning for this utilization strategically. Sorry, I'm drinking some orange juice. Um, so, high pressure to refactor applications, take advantage of cloudy services. So, what I found is, amongst many different groups of individuals, um, the thought is, oh, I can just use the managed services. I can use the cloudy services. Um, like App Engine, um, GCS, Firebase, um, et cetera, and I'll be better. I'll be more cost efficient. Um, and, uh, and so it's important to note that throwing cloudy services at a problem won't necessarily resolve it, but these cloudy services, when used appropriately, could. And so we have to actually consider the way that the, the costs for these um, native cloud services will scale over time. And generally, that cost is scaled linearly. So um, the disadvantage of linear cost scaling um, alongside you know, linear user base is that I, I don't get to take advantage of um, economies of scale like I would if I was building more of a, a, a traditional cluster. Larger the cluster gets, the more easily I can absorb spikes, et cetera. So it's just something to consider. Um, <clears throat> also, if you're using GCS already, um, you know, we can think about object lifecycle management where um, we're moving data off to other, other locations or even deleting it um, once it's not in use. So the rub. Um, so yes, um, traditional file systems are still here. Um, you know, if you're running a, a VM in, in, in GCP, um, that's going to have a file system in place. And that file system is basically going to, is going to be based off a persistent disk. And that persistent disk, um, you're going to pay for it um, for, for what's provisioned. It's not necessarily cloudy. Um, there are some advantages um, over like a standard physical hard drive, but those are still in place. Um, and the disadvantage with persistent disks is that, again, um, if you only use 10% of that disk, you're still paying for 100% of what you provision. However, we have to think about the ROI. Uh, um, if, if, it, if it costs us, um, you know, 10, 20, 30, you know, $40,000 in developer costs to refactor our application to use something like GCS as opposed to local disk, we have to think about how long that's going to um, take to pay off. Maybe, maybe it'll take um, two, three years for us to actually get return on investment for that change. Um, so companies will often take us um, a compromise and pay for disk uh, um, inefficiently um, because it's actually the smarter way to do it as opposed to um, refactoring. So, um, so again, it's always a, a give and take. And, and I love to play the uh, devil's advocate in these types of conversations. 
Um, okay, so we've talked about compute, we've talked about storage. Next is the elephant in the room, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is um, great. It's a good tool. The industry has adopted it as um, the standard containerization um, orchestrator, container orchestrator, if you will. And it's in use in all the clouds, um, but of course it is Google's brainchild. Um, and given its um, massive trajectory, uh, you know, I think, I think that fits. Um, Google built this to do exactly what it's doing and it has. Um, so it, for those of you unfamiliar, Kubernetes again is an orchestrator for containers, generally working with Docker to, um, to uh, manage Docker containers across the cluster. So when running Kubernetes in cloud, um, any cloud, but Google in particular, um, though others have the same problem, um, we want to scale um, based on you know something, RAM, CPU utilization, whatever. Um, but it's not, we, um, what I'm finding is our, our customers, when uh, creating a Kubernetes infrastructure, a Kubernetes cluster, we're actually finding that scaling is not working as expected. So, so I'll explain. Um, so how would you expect a cluster to scale um, as an auto scaling group um, based on utilization? So you might start out with two nodes. Each of these nodes are running at 10% um, utilization and, and, uh, and the 90 in the red you see there is um, uh, not utilized, but you're still paying for it, right? So less red is better. So then you might expect, okay, I have some increased traffic, so I have increased um, utilization on the instances. This is a good thing um, to a certain extent. And then at some point, 70, 80, 90%, we'll want to actually increase our capacity in the cluster um, so that we don't run into any weight conditions or, or issues with 100% uh, utilization. And so we might be able to add a node um, dynamically, um, and then that reduces the overall cluster utilization per node down uh, sorry, yeah, it reduces the per node utilization um, to a lower number than 70, but overall we're handling more and we have the capacity to scale. So this is, this is the, um, uh, the quintessential idea behind an auto scaling instance group. But what we're actually seeing from, for a lot of our customers who are starting out in Kubernetes on cloud is this. They start out, same place, 10% utilization, and then they increase in utilization. And a, and a weird thing happens, this their average node, our average utilization per node stays at 10% or approximate, could be 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever, stays linear. Um, and then when they add a node, um, it stays about the same. And then happens again. So, so this is um, due to a very specific misconfiguration in Kubernetes and I'm gonna explain um, briefly. Um, uh, but don't have uh, enough time to get fully into. I'll just be able to get you guys on the right track in, in learning about this yourself. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, so what's going on here is um, there is a misconfiguration. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with Kubernetes, none of this is gonna make sense, but if you're familiar with Kubernetes, maybe you've run into this problem before. When you create a deployment, and deployment is like a, uh, an object in Kubernetes that is used to essentially um, manage a group of containers across the cluster. Uh, in this deployment, in the pod spec, um, you're defining what are uh, like resources, they call it resources. And there are two types of resources, there's reserved and, and limits. So what limits do is, hey, if this container uses, you know, more than this number of gigs of RAM, there's a, there's a memory leak, terminate it and recreate it, right? So it helps to um, protect you against memory leaks. Um, and then the same thing for CPU, except it really just caps out in CPU utilization as opposed to terminating the container. Um, so the other type of resource is reservations. So reservations are uh, otherwise known as soft limits, are a way that Kubernetes can actually track um, what the expected resources required for this container are and make sure that in the actual overall cluster itself, there is enough resources to run all the containers that are requested. Um, so there's two uh, components that are used to pull this off. One is the, um, the horizontal pod autoscaler, which creates more pods the, um, to, to, to 
keep up with utilization. And then there's the cluster autoscaler, which actually grows the number of nodes in a cluster um, uh, to keep up with the amount of containers that are being spun up by the horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, so, so the cluster autoscaler actually interfaces with the underlying infrastructure, whether that's Google or, or any other cloud, um, and adds nodes to the cluster um, to achieve that, that, um, uh, that requested resource limit, um, as opposed to scaling based on raw CPU. Uh, so why is the structure in place at all? Like, why can't we just scale on, on CPU? Uh, I believe that Kubernetes was, uh, was thought up in a, in a weird hybrid period where um, cloud was not um, fully fledged and a lot of the resources or a lot, a lot of the workloads were still on physical infrastructure. And so the, the standard practice was, I wanna have one or, or two big clusters and run many, many applications on these clusters across my, my enterprise to reduce management and administration overhead for that cluster. But now with managed um, Kubernetes, it's very easy uh, for us to spin up um, uh, multiple GKE clusters or worker node groups um, uh, with very little overhead. And, and so, so, so now we have the situation where instead of having very, very large clusters, we have appropriately sized clusters. And I think that there is a dichotomy between the mindset of the people who created the um, uh, cluster autoscaler and pod autoscaler um, versus you know, modern users of Kubernetes. So um, what do we do about that? Well, well there's one very, one, one very specific thing that we can do about this, which is correcting our resource um, limit uh, uh, and reservation declarations. Um, so again, uh, apologies for those of you not, not technical, I'm showing you code, uh, deal with it. So, um, so within resources, there's requests and limits. The idea here is that we wanna make sure that we get our CPU and memory under the requests section appropriately um, uh, uh, set. And an appropriate number for those things should be um, what, well for RAM, it should be, it should be what, is, what the application is expected to run. Not more, but just as, just as much. Um, this is important because um, we, uh, you know, this number is used to, to scale the amount of nodes in a cluster um, oftentimes more than, than CPU. So we wanna make sure our memory is not too big. Oftentimes it is set too big. Um, and so we have all these um, nodes out there that, that you know, are um, you know, 95% uh, utilized from a memory perspective because, um, because the request section of the resources block is set inappropriately. Same thing with CPU, we wanna make sure that we're not reserving a one core per container, otherwise that would go crazy. We wanna make sure that we set our requests very low and our limits a little bit higher so that um, if, the, if the container ever reaches that period of memory saturation, we know that there's a problem, container will be terminated, problem solved. Okay, so um, what are some key takeaways from what we've just discussed? Well, um, simple infrastructure uh, op adoption is not, in cloud is not a panacea. So, so oftentimes um, companies will say, oh, you know, all this, this is, this is too complicated. We're going to um, we're going to go back um, to uh, to just doing things the way that we're used to, uh, static servers, and uh, and then and then call it a day and not deal with any of the the crazy issues that we can see with with native cloud resources and and, and scaling and cost optimization. But um, you know, running away from this problem is not a panacea. Um, oftentimes, it leads to um, to even worse cost inefficiencies. Uh, at the same time, we also don't want to aggressively adopt cloud native um, services without considering the cost impact of those services. Just because it's a managed cloudy service and that it's native doesn't mean that it's cost effective, especially at scale. Um, and that this decision um, and this conversation has to be done at the application level, um, just as much, if not more than it is at the IT level. Oftentimes refactoring applications for native services requires developer effort, not just IT configuration. So we have to consider bringing these groups together, which is the idea of DevOps. Um, so two, consider creative purchasing. So using reservations, commits, et cetera. It's a, in, in general, creative purchasing is a CIO, CFO level decision, but they need to be informed by their engineering team as to you know, when they are at a place that is stable and when it is appropriate to, um, uh, to 
to um, to create reservations to purchase ahead ahead of time to save money, um, because it is um, usually very difficult for C level executives to understand um, what is coming down the pipe as far as infrastructure requests go. So we have to make sure that we have um, broad communication um, between levels of, of the hierarchy um, in our tech organization. And uh, um, also architectural design and concepting is key to cost efficiency at hyperscale. We have to think at a broad level about how our infrastructure is set up and how we are setting ourselves up for success. Um, and um, uh, oftentimes that's, um, uh, you know, um, a, a broad business level conversation. Uh, other times it's a very, very deep engineering conversation. Um, and so getting the right resources to do this for you is very, very important. And what happens if it's not done? Um, so, you know, it can be drastic. Um, ignoring cost optimization efforts is, um, uh, you know, can, there, there are a lot of inefficiencies, inefficiencies to be had uh, here. And, and when you're working in cloud, spend can increase so fast. Um, I've seen cases where, you know, a customer, their average spend will be, you know, 300 bucks a month and somebody clicked the wrong button and they got a bill for eight or $9,000 um, in a day. Um, so it's very important to, um, to understand what will impact what and how we can control these things. Um, because again, that, you know, cloud is, is built to scale no matter where you take it. Um, but scaling accidentally is a big problem. So for example, App Engine's default spend cap is $1,000 a day. Um, for most people, that's way too much. Um, so, um, so, and this is the default value. Right? So we need to be prepared for this and understand that if we're not ready for the horsepower of cloud. Um, we, have to, we have to put a limiter on that and, 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 um, and, and keep that under control. And, and some of the um, costs, uh, you know, the, the risks rather, that we, that we inherit here are, are rapid linear expansion of native cloud services costs. Uh, I've seen um, you know, native cloud services when not, when not implemented appropriately can scale linearly based on customer utilization um, uh, or customer usage, which can be drastic um, if that linear line is not efficient. Um, uh, performance can be impacted. And you know, for example, with App Engine, if you set your cap too small, um, customer performance will be degraded because then App Engine will not be able to spin up um, more resources to handle um, increased uh, um, utilization. And then if um, strategic purchasing is done incorrectly or not, mo um, not monitored, that type of reservation can actually increase costs. So we need to be um, constantly looking at this and reviewing our efficiencies. Okay, so um, Let's see. Uh, so what we have here is actually a couple um, case studies from some of our clients. Uh, names removed, but um, uh, from some of our happy clients who, um, you know, Sears has helped, um, and um, uh, you know that I, I suppose uh, stories that we wanted to share. So um, infrastructure optimization and scalability consult consultation for blockchain solutions company. Blockchain, um, you know. Uh, Hipster words, right? Uh, so the client had configured and managed a GCP environment in-house for development requirements for the solution. And um, with plans to make the solution live in the next business quarter, they needed expert consultation. So we came in and helped them out. Um, and um, we reduced their cost um, by a really substantial margin, 20%, um, uh, which, you know, if you're, if you're a medium-sized business and your, um, your cloud costs are uh, 40, 50, you know, even $100,000 a month, 20% um, reduction is uh, substantial. Right? Um, so, and, you know, after, gone, have, after having gone through this, the client is now in a better, uh, better place from, uh, to, to ensure their sustainability. Um, so, uh, anyways, um, I'd like to pause here. I know that was a ton of data and we've used up a pretty good chunk of the webinar time. Um, I want to pause for, for Q&A. Um, so it, it does look like we got a few questions um, coming in via chat. Um, so we can uh, dig through these questions. But uh, if you have any questions, um, anything you'd like to ask me or the Sears group or Mac, please feel free to drop them in chat. Okay, so we got a few questions from the group. Um, 
So one of those are, we have a live running project on GCP. It's a mobile application running on Compute Engine and current CPU utilization is at 20%. With no major scaling uh, projections over the next one year, what are some of the things we should consider when planning for a scale down event? Great question. Um, you know, what are some of the things we should consider when planning for a scale down? Right, we always talk about scale up. What about scaling down? Um, you know, this is very tricky because you need to understand your, um, your base limit utilization. You need to understand um, what we can remove. So for example, with GCS, there's no way to um, spin down utilization costs without removing data. So how do we, um, how do we remove that data without dropping application um, functionality, right? Um, how do we um, drop our CPU utilization while also accounting for potential spikes? Uh, so there, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of factors in that. Um, and I would say one of the biggest factors is um, taking another look at your reserved, um, your, your, your strategic purchasing and your reservations. Because if you've reserved a certain number and you're not using that number anymore, you still pay for that number. So down scaling will help. Um, so an, another question, in what situations one consider using stack drivers? So stack driver is, is great for monitoring utilization in a cluster and monitoring um, you know, what, um, uh, what is going on on your instances so you can uh, more appropriately plan for things. Um, also helps you figure out if there are problems or you know, application level errors that are causing inefficiencies. Um, so Stackdriver's job is visibility, but it's important to remember that Stackdriver itself has costs um, and to plan for those costs and to use them efficiently. Uh, let's see. And um, Mac, we have a question for you. If the customers optimize their infra, it means their costs are going to go down. Uh, this indeed means that Google's revenue from these customers will, will reduce. What drives Google to promote these initiatives, right? So. Um, so why would you want to help customers reduce costs if that um, is going to bring Google's bottom end down? Um, uh, so that's a little, little bit of an aggressive question, but um, you know, I wanted to, uh, I definitely want to bring that to you. Tough time today, attending calls it seems like, so I <laughs> profusely apologize. Uh, so the line just dropped, but uh, to answer your question, um, the if you if you really look at the consumption business uh, overall, we really want to focus on what makes Google Cloud Platform different than a cloud platform. And you know, there's two ways to go about it. One is you look at the LTVA, like a lifetime value of a customer, um, and then two is you know doing what's right for the customer and knowing that you know, the platform itself will develop in ways for every user base, every user that we have, there's learnings to be had from these customers, from the interactions. So yes, in the short term, it, the spend may go down, but every business, if it's a successful business and every business is here to grow with that mentality in mind, we're really focused on the long-term value of the customer. Yeah, I think, thanks, Mac. I, I, I've, I've seen that kind of thing as well. I've seen you know, companies who have adopted cloud, um, built up infrastructure, had cost issues, did an optimization and really felt more confident about their infrastructure. And that led them to, um, to make moves and, and to grow their business and actually grow it in a way that was more sustainable um, than, um, than unhealthy cost models and, and help, you know, it, they were actually able to understand where their costs are and why those costs were there um, to, um, to make sure that they were being efficient. So, so I agree with your answer. Uh, I appreciate that. And then um, sure. I, another question, um, are these optimization programs available for all GCP customers or are there any uh, qualifiers that apply? So, so do, do you have to be of a certain size in order to take advantage of, of some of the programs that Google offers? The only qualifier that we have for this particular program is you have to have a be a spending customer uh, in GCP. So there's no other qualifiers that we can think of at this moment um, with the current program rules. Brad, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I mean, hey, you, you never know when uh, 
the next Pokemon Go will hit and, um, <laughs> you know, you'll have to uh, help out a customer who, you know, last month was 500 bucks and, you know, now they're going to be, you know, 50,000 and then their revenue is, is scaled just as appropriately. Um, so we have some more content here. Um, wanted to um, hand this over to Mac to speak a little bit about 2020 vision and, um, and some of the uh, programs that Google has available. Mac, I, I apologize for sucking up all your time. <laughs> Um, but no, uh, no, I think I think I, I think I talked up more time in, in trying to figure out how phones and computers coexist um, together today. So my apologies. In in thir in less than one minute. Um, so basically, 2020. What are we What are we doing to empower our existing spending customers, other than giving them up to 1.2 gigawatts of Google Cloud? I guess. Um, so there's it's a four prong uh, uh, basically program. Uh, it's built with, uh, you know, with incentives in mind, training, workshops, and a dedicated Google team. Uh, basically, we are unlocking resources for customers that were previously available for enterprise-level customers, like commit discounts, for example. We're also unlocking uh, credits, GCP course credits for plural site. So customers with minimal staffing uh, and customers who are fairly new to the to the GCP or cloud in general can train the staff uh, and be enabled themselves. Um, also workshops and webinars that webinars like this, but also more one-on-one -on -one workshops around pricing, roadmap reviews, and modernization. And then finally, a team, a global team of Googlers um, that, uh, that will engage with our customers that are spending right now. Um, previously, this was only available for mid-market and enterprise, but now the account management function has been um, extended to the SMB customers as well. So a lot of things in 2020 to help our existing customer base in summary. Thanks, Mac. Um, so a few more things about Sears and, and um, you know, what we do, what we've created to, how we want to help. Um, so hold on. here we go. Um, so we have uh, a broad portfolio of services, uh, as mentioned earlier, that we can help with um, business process improvement, engineering, cloud operations, uh, DevOps, migration, infrastructure modernization, all the way up to AI and ML. And, and, and you know, the, our, our, our portfolio of services is really meant to help customers um, adopt native cloud services um, and accelerate into some of the most advanced things that they can do with hyperscaled infrastructure, uh, being AI and ML, and, and, and getting access to the, um, uh, the business acceleration, business acceleration that, can, that can happen when they are able to leverage those services. Um, so again, we, you know, we're not just infrastructure people. We also um, license uh, G Suite, uh, we have, you know, thousands of clients globally. We've migrated 20,500 servers. That number is always growing. Um, and we also do some really um, advanced maps implementation for geofencing uh, and GIS, um, which, uh, you know, some people don't even know exists, um, that there's a, uh, there's a maps enterprise that allows you to, to do um, advanced operations in that way. Uh, so if you're ever um, interested in any of these things or interested in what Cirrus can do for your company, please do reach out to us. If you have any questions at all, um, feel free to reach out to me or uh, um, ask a question here or, or reach out to, you know, give, give Sears a call, uh, send us an email, we'll be able to get those questions answered and, and hopefully accelerate you into your next phase of cloud adoption. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much and thank you, Mac, for joining us.